Hello, good morning. Hello, everyone. Can you, can you please uh, get seated? We are getting started. Hello, good morning again. Um, distinguished uh, guests, um, invited participants from various countries, and uh, GPS donors from the United Kingdom, from Switzerland, from Germany, and other participants uh, joining us online. We have over 300 people registered online uh, around the world. Um, welcome and uh, all protocol observed. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Bekele Alashifarau. I'm the program manager for the Global Program on Sustainability at the World Bank. And um, a very well, warm welcome to our the sevens Seventh Global Policy Forum on Natural Capital. Here at this vibrant, clean and green city of, um, of Kigali in Rwanda. Uh, the Global Program on Sustainability uh, took over from the WAVES, uh, Wales Accounting and Evaluation of Ecosystem Services, which has been running for many years. And it works on the economics of natural capital and sustainability and provides technical support to about 30 countries around the world to devise better policies and to address market and institutional constraints and factors that drive depletion of natural capital and ecosystem services. We work on natural capital because nature is our most precious asset to fight climate change and to end poverty um, across developing countries. And natural capital is the most important asset in many countries, uh, in low-income countries, and uh, including Rwanda. Um, and we cannot achieve sustainability without protecting biodiversity and ecosystem services that provide essential foundations for life on this planet. GPS has been organizing various policy forums like this over the years. Uh, we have done this annually with interest on connecting data and analysis with policy, uh, providing evidence that informs policy decisions on, on ways to manage natural capital, including biodiversity and ecosystem services, and linkage policy, policy processes at national level, at different levels, uh, from micro to macro to regional and global levels. This year, we are focusing on biodiversity and implementation of the global biodiversity framework, which was agreed at uh, Kuming, Montreal in uh, 2022. Our interest in particular in this forum is to discuss how better data and analysis and evidence, including policy analysis and the natural capital accounting approaches can be leveraged and used to support implementation of this framework to achieve the 2030 biodiversity uh, targets. This is the first in-person meeting uh, of this kind we are having um, after the COVID uh, pandemic, and we are delighted that many of you have joined us in person here in, in today in Kigali, and many also joining us online. We have lined up an informative interactive agenda uh, for a dialogue over these two days to discuss several important issues that are vital for implementing the, the global biodiversity framework at national level. This includes uh, a couple of keynotes, uh, which will be delivered today and tomorrow, and, uh, and, uh, and also selected presentations and facilita facilitated moderated panel discussions on various selected topics. Let me now uh, introduce our chief facilitator for the event, uh, who will be helping us navigate uh, the different sessions, uh, Dr. Philip Posano, uh, who is standing here. Uh, he's a director of the Stockholm Environment Cent Institute, Africa Center, he's based in Nairobi. And Philip is a, an environmental policy analyst and expert. Uh, he has a, he's a strong champion uh, for nature and natural capital accounting in Africa and also, also globally. I'm so glad that he is able to join us uh, today. So, so uh, please welcome Philip, and thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bekele. Good morning. Good morning. Are we excited? Yes. Okay, can I see by show of hands? Okay, great. Um, Honorable State Minister and uh, our guest, um, we are very pleased, of course, to have you in the opening session. Uh, as Dr. Bekele said, we, we are starting a very intense two days of engagement. Uh, we want to make it exciting. Um, we have 10 sessions in the program, uh, two of which also are keynote sessions, which we are looking forward to. Um, I also wish to mention that um, we will have poster sessions. Um, and of course, during breaks, uh, we, have, we have posters outside there. So we really encourage you, of course, to uh, you know, take a gallery walk and talk to, to, the, to the poster presenters because therein there's a lot of richness in detail. Um, I also uh, know we have colleagues that are participating virtually, um, over 300 colleagues from across the world. Uh, so please, we also look forward to engage with them. And later on, we'll share a hashtag that you can also you know, uh, promote uh, what's going on on social media. Um, we will start today um, by our opening session, uh, which is high level session. Um, and uh, I just wanted, before calling our speakers, just wanted to say something that we are very short on time. So of course, uh, along the way, I'll, you'll see me sort of like trying to probe you. Uh, and I have a tool here, uh, which you'll see me working with. So if, I, if you hear something ringing, just know that uh, you're supposed to sort of like uh, take some action. Uh, but allow me to um, open, um, get the opening session going. Uh, we are very privileged to have the World Bank Country Manager uh, for Rwanda, uh, Dr. Saar Punde, uh, who will uh, give us, uh, kick us off. Most welcome, sir. Honorable Minister, Dr. Claudine Ware, Minister of State for Environment in the Ministry of Environment in Rwanda. Mr. Ozoni Ogelio, the UN Resident Coordinator in Rwanda. Ms. Valerie Hickey, the Global Director for Environment, Natural Resources, and Blue Economy at the World Bank. Distinguished delegates representing member countries, their esteemed colleagues and forum participants, including all joining us online from around the world, all protocols observed. Good morning. In Rwanda, we say Maramutse. It is my great honor to welcome you all to this seventh global policy forum on natural capital under the special theme, implementing the global biodiversity framework, leveraging natural capital data accounting and analysis to inform policies. Let me start on behalf of the World Bank by expressing our thanks to the government of Rwanda for graciously accepting to host this global forum in this beautiful green and clean city of Kigali. I also would like to thank the United Nations Statistics Division, UNDS, that has been part of organizing this forum for their collaboration in building capacity in developing countries. The Natural Capital Policy Forum is organized annually by the World Bank's Global Program for Sustainability, GPS, and has elevated and stimulated the dialogue on nature positive and climate smart policies across countries and continues to serve as a global platform for sharing experiences and lessons on good practices and effective interventions. GPS is building capacity for mainstreaming natural capital into decision making globally including through supporting the African Natural Capital Accounting Community of Practice. GPS is also supporting about 30 countries globally, including Rwanda, to strengthen national capacity. As you may be aware, 
The World Bank recently adopted a new vision statement to create a world free of poverty on a livable planet, which has bolstered the role that natural capital and biodiversity play in addressing the development challenges and the triple planetary crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. GPS is part of this change, increasingly shaping how the World Bank Group is working, making nature a vital part of our responses to climate and development challenges. We wish to thank our generous donors, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Switzerland, that make it possible for us to scale up these successful and timely initiatives. The opportune theme of this global policy forum underpins and brings to the forefront the role of natural capital data, accounting, and analysis to inform policies and development plans of countries in implementing the global biodiversity framework that the parties of the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity adopted in Kunming, Montreal in December 2022. The Global Biodiversity Framework sets 23 global targets for urgent action by 2030 and four long-term goals to be achieved by 2050, looking for safeguarding biodiversity and ensuring its sustainable use for the well-being of present and future generations. In particular, the GBF highlights the need to fully integrate biodiversity and its multiple values into national policies, instruments, and tools, including systems for measurement of national accounts. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to the Nairobi Declaration and Call for Action that was issued by the African Natural Capital Accounting Community of Practice following the meeting held in Nairobi in September last year. The declaration emphasized the urgency to protect and harness natural capital and ecosystem services for addressing the urgent development needs while also responding collectively to pressing global challenges. The challenges facing humanity are indeed complex. And in many countries, the climate nature poverty interface is highly linked with degradation of natural capital, for example, land degradation and deforestation. Natural capital accounting offers proven and global accepted standards to furnish the information needed to take nature's contributions to people and economies into account and to integrate actions as part of country responses to global climate and biodiversity goals. Currently, the World Bank and other development partners are working with countries in preparing and submitting their national biodiversity strategies and action plans to the CBD, including national targets. Data, accounts, and analytics on natural capital are needed for designing, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating the achievements and impacts of the GBF and the national biodiversity policies and actions. Fostering global cooperation and capacity building is needed to generate and capitalize on natural capital data, accounts, and policy analysis to inform nature and climate policies and development plans. And those are key for ending poverty on a livable planet and living in harmony with nature. Allow me to reiterate the commitment of the World Bank to continue playing an active role in advancing the good work that dialogues like this global forum on natural capital are providing to advance ambitious actions to meet national and local development aspirations and implement global biodiversity and climate agenda. So let me close by wishing you all very productive discussions 
and looking forward to the important recommendations that participants and countries present here will take home to advance our common aspirations for green, inclusive, and climate resilient growth. I thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sa, and uh, also to your team that has graciously welcomed uh, us here organizing all the logistics. Um, we really appreciate. Uh, colleagues, um, I move now to our second speaker, uh, Mr. Ozonia Ojielo. Uh, Mr. Ojielo is a veteran of the United Nations. He has uh, been working at the UN for over 25 years uh, in, many, in many stations, actually, uh, including, I see, Kenya, and also in, 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 in Central Asia, uh, Kyrgyzstan. So you bring in a rich uh, experience. Uh, the UN has been, you know, the UN Statistics Division has been uh, a very central player in this meeting, uh, and also very central player in terms of advancing the natural capital agenda in, at country level. So Mr. Ojelo, um, the floor is yours, welcome. A round of applause as it comes, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Osano. Honorable Minister of State for the Environment, my dear sister, Dr. Claudine Uwera, the World Bank country manager, a friend, brother, and close collaborator, Dr. Unde, the Global Director for Environment and Natural Resources, uh, our dear friends from the World Bank, from uh, UN Statistics Division, from various state, non-state institutions, here present, but also represented online. And then, of course, the generous uh, development partners who continue to support this wonderful program. So I'd like to join my dear brother, Sir, in welcoming everyone to this uh, forum, seventh global forum on natural capital, but in particular to acknowledge the leadership and to thank the government of Rwanda for generously hosting us and providing this space for this important conversation. And of course, to celebrate my colleagues at the bank and at our statistics division for this excellent collaboration. And so over the next two days, this forum will focus on implementing the global diversity framework. How do we leverage natural capital data, accounting and analysis to inform policies at the national level? So such a diverse audience as is here constituted, including those uh, here, more than 300 participants that have joined online, should give us hope about strengthening statistics, but also developing natural data accounts, because this is critical in informing our policies to fight climate change, but also to prevent and protect biodiversity, prevent biodiversity loss. When we leverage natural capital data accounting and analysis, it allows us to play a pivotal role to inform policies that are related to the global biodiversity framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so by integrating comprehensive natural capital data into policy frameworks, governments and international organizations are able to make informed decisions that prioritize biodiversity conservation while at the same time considering our socioeconomic development. This integration it involves utilizing data on ecosystem services, biodiversity indicators, and economic valuations to create a more holistic understanding of the benefits and the values that are provided by nature. For instance, by incorporating natural capital accounting into national income measures, countries are better able to assess the true costs and benefits of economic activities on biodiversity. Furthermore, analysis based on natural capital data helps in setting ambitious yet achievable targets within the global biodiversity framework. Policymakers are able to identify areas of critical importance for conservation, to allocate resources effectively, and to monitor progress 
towards our biodiversity goals. Analysis also enables the examination of trade-offs between different policy options, such as evaluating the economic benefits of conservation efforts versus the potential short-term gains from exploitation. Through stakeholder engagement and capacity building, policies informed by natural capital data can be more effectively implemented and enforced. This approach not only improves the effectiveness of biodiversity conservation, but also promotes sustainable development, which recognizes the intrinsic value of ecosystems as well as the services they provide to humanity. The Global Biodiversity Framework Monitoring Framework is currently being developed as a collaborative effort that involves various stakeholders, including many in the UN system. These stakeholders play a critical role in providing technical expertise, coordinating efforts, but also facilitating the integration of the monitoring framework into national and global biodiversity strategies. Their roles include supporting countries in indicator selection, data collection, capacity building, as well as providing guidelines for reporting. At the moment, the metadata for the indicators are being developed under the overall leadership of the ad hoc technical expert group and will be submitted for adoption at the Conference of Parties later this year. I'm very happy to see that this important global event is taking place in Africa as preserving biodiversity in Africa is of paramount importance to us due to the continent's rich and diverse ecosystems that support millions of people, as well as our unique wildlife species. Africa's biodiversity provides essential ecosystem services, such as clean air, water, and fertile soil, crucial for agriculture and human well-being. Additionally, many communities in Africa rely directly on natural resources for their livelihoods, including fishing, agriculture, and traditional medicine. Preserving biodiversity also safeguards against climate change impacts. As intact ecosystems can sequester carbon and buffer against extreme weather events. Furthermore, Africa is home to iconic wildlife such as elephants, rhinos, and lions, making conservation efforts crucial for the tourism industry, which also supports our local economies. Preserving biodiversity in Africa is not just about protecting ecosystems and wildlife. It is also about ensuring sustainable development, food security, and cultural heritage for current and future generations. High quality integrated data and statistics, in particular, well-developed and integrated natural capital accounts on the environment economy nexus will therefore be critical to making these kinds of decisions and policies. NCA, underpinned by the system of environmental accounting, environmental economic accounting as the international statistical standard is an umbrella term that covers efforts to use an accounting framework to provide a systematic way to measure and to report on the stocks and flows of natural capital. Its underlying premise is that since the environment is important to society and the economy, it should be recognized as an asset that must be maintained and managed, and its contributions be better integrated into commonly used frameworks like the system of national accounts. As such, the SEA provides countries with a framework for deriving internationally comparable sets of statistics and indicators. It is in particular relevant for monitoring international policy initiatives, including the Cumin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, and the Paris Agreement. In closing, I hope this global forum will bring many new partnerships between practitioners from all over the region and clearly illustrate the use cases of the natural capital accounts. This will hopefully strengthen the resolve to understand and inform policy better with more accurate and timely statistics. 
I would like to thank our partners for collaborating on this forum together. Most importantly, our host government for hosting the event and the World Bank's Global Program of Sustainability and the United Nations Statistics Division for co-organizing it. For those of you who are coming to Rwanda for the first time, please do remember that this is a workshop. Every workshop has two parts, the work and the shop. <laughs> Make sure you don't leave Kigali without the shop. There are many interesting things that are on offer. If in doubt, my sister sitting right behind here in the front table will provide you guidance about where to go. Morakoze <laughs> Chiani. Another round of applause, please. Yeah, uh, please, if you have time, talk to uh, Mr. Ojiel. He told me to call him OO, double O. So I'm, I'm glad you remind him about the shopping uh, part of the workshop, which we, 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 we normally don't remember. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, the next speaker is uh, a very, very, very special speaker. Um, I, I, I couldn't think of any champion that you could have for this forum um, than our next speaker, Honorable Claudine Uera. Uh, she has a background in environment economics. Uh, she's currently serving as the Minister of State uh, for the Environment in the Ministry of Environment um, uh, of the Government of Rwanda, which is, of course, our host today. Um, I say we couldn't have any other champion, any better champion, because um, before her current position, uh, she was serving uh, in the Ministry of Economic Planning uh, um, and Minister of Finance. Um, and before that, she was actually uh, the national coordinator of the Rwanda Natural Capital Accounting Program. So she knows more than myself and many colleagues here. Uh, Honorable Minister, please, most welcome. Could we give the minister a round of applause? much moderator maybe I start with the last word is uh, highlighted by Ozonia the meaning of the workshop just work and shop yeah thank you very much uh, Dr. Sar uh, World Bank country manager uh, for Rwanda Dr. Ozonia UN resident coordinator in Rwanda uh, Dr. Valerie Hickey global director for environment natural resource and blue economy global practice World Bank Engineer Festus and Gweno, the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change in Kenya. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Daphne Chabu, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, Zambia. Distinguished delegates uh, representing member countries, uh, dear esteemed colleagues, and the forum participants, including all joining us online from around the world, all protocol observed. Good morning. Ngaramutse. I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the host, which is the government of Rwanda, to this seventh global policy forum on natural capital. Uh, welcome to a country of thousand hills, and uh, I hope you will feel the warmth of the people of Rwanda. Allow me on behalf of the government of Rwanda to show our gratitude for the World Bank and partner having chosen Rwanda to host this imperative uh, global forum on natural capital. As we convene here today, it's imperative to recognize the profound significance of biodiversity and ecosystem services in shaping our environment, sustaining our livelihoods, and fostering resilience in face of a global challenge. We stand at a pivot, a pivot moment in our collective effort to combat the tangled challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation. As we gather today to deliberate during this global forum, we signal our commitment to a future where the health of our planet and the well-being of our people are paramount. Therefore, our actions must be unified and our determination to address 
those global challenges is unwavering. The world is witnessing unprecedented changes to our climate and ecosystems, demanding urgent concerned actions. Our planet's health cannot be considered in isolation. The time is now to realize the alignment of our nationally determined contribution and national biodiversity strategy and action plans, ensuring that our climate and biodiversity actions reinforce one another. It encourages us to adopt whole of government approaches and fosters inclusivity, recognizing that effective change required engagement of all sectors in society. Loss of nature and biodiversity, therefore, affect both the economies and the human well-being. Unfortunately, mounting evidence document that several impact drivers related to human activities like pollution, land and sea use changes, and over exploitations of uh, natural resources, amongst others, and, over, and leading to ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. The failure to adequately account for the role that uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services play for economic growth and human well-being underpins the persistence, degradation of nature and loss of biodiversity in many across the globe. We're gathered here in Kigali to seek inclusive solutions to the triple planetary crisis, the crisis of nature and biodiversity loss, the, cr the crisis of climate change, and the crisis of pollution and waste. Realistically, without a doubt, when countries adopted the implementation of natural capital to produce consistent data and analysis under the globally adapted system of environmental economic accounting, is the universally accepted international statistical standard for natural capital accounting. This provides a framework for organizing and presenting statistics and information on the environment and uh, in relationship with the economy, thereby counting, integrating, and valuing nature to inform policies and development plans of our countries. Rwandan economy is mostly a nature-based economy. The majority of the population is engaged in nature-based economic activities, such as agriculture, forestry, nature-based tourism, etc. And Rwanda realized this fact long ago. And following a political commitment in 2012 in Gaborone, Botswana, the government of Rwanda and other African countries signed the Gaboron, the Gaboron Declaration, reaffirming the commitment to pursue and ensure that the contribution of natural capital to sustainable economic growth, maintenance, and improvement of social capital and human well-being are quantified and integrated into development and business practices. Rwanda started developing the natural capital accounting since 2014. Implementation gained technical assistance provided by the World Bank under the Welfare Accounting and Evaluation of Ecosystem Services Global Partnership Program for Rwanda. And building on this successful experience, we're happy to see the World Bank continued support and technical assistance for mainstreaming natural capital into country program and policies through GPS, the Global Program on Sustainability. Rwanda had developed four accounts, which are the land account, water account, mineral account, and ecosystem account. The outcome policy recommendation informed, among others, the National Strategy for Transformation, the NST1, the National Land Use Development Master Plan, the reforming process for of our institutions, for example, Rwanda Water Resource Board, and so on. Furthermore, the NCA data has informed the ongoing World Bank funded Volcanoes Community Resilience Project, VCRP, and the other project aimed at addressing biodiversity deficient and climate prone areas in the northern and western part of Rwanda. 
The seventh global policy forum on natural capital comes at the right moment to bring together governments and other relevant stakeholders and to discuss the policies that will help in the implementation of global biodiversity framework aligned to national biodiversity strategies and the action plan and its targets that require collective efforts at international and national level in mobilizing finance if the global biodiversity conservation for people and the planet is to be achieved. Given past fluctuations in biodiversity expenses and how many streaming of biodiversity in sectors depends on biodiversity and ecosystem services, Rwanda wished to expand and enhance the country's biodiversity finance in a bid to achieve national biodiversity targets. Rwanda aims at establishing a biodiversity facility within the Rwanda Green Fund to create a revolving fund from environmental revenue. This fund is expected to attract additional funding sources and contribute to various objectives, including enforcement, generating domestic resources, building institutional capacity, and avoiding or reducing future expenditure. Moreover, in the spirit of global solidarity and shared responsibility, Rwanda stands ready to collaborate with international partners and stakeholders to address those challenges collectively by leveraging our collective expertise, resources, and commitment, we can chart a path towards a more sustainable and resilient future for both present and future generations. In conclusion, I, I would wish to highlight that the government of Rwanda is committed to advancing the institutionalization of NCA and improve environmental statistics to inform evidence-based policy decision-making by integrating NCA into the system of national account toward producing the green GDP. I wish you all a very successful forum and looking forward to working together to implement the recommendation that will be adopted in this video forum. Also, I would like to recommend that you spare some time and visit our beautiful country, Rwanda, has, Rwanda has so much uh, to offer all visitors on behalf of the government of Rwanda and on my behalf, and with your permission, of course, I declare the seventh uh, Global Policy Forum open. Thank you very much. Okay, another round of applause for Honorable State Minister as she takes a seat. I think we've all been inspired. Um, the government of Rwanda and um, what you've heard from the Honorable State Minister is actually that you're walking the talk. Uh, because I think when I was just listening to the speech, it was very impressive, um, the kind of work that has been done. And if there's the part of the workshop that I would encourage all of you to focus on is please take your time and learn from colleagues from Rwanda. Um, and I speak from a, a point of... Uh, um, very informed position because uh, my, my organization, Stockholm Environment Institute, has had the privilege uh, to work with the World Bank and the Rwanda Water Board on the, on the water accounts. So I know from that experience that you know, there's a very strong leadership in terms of uh, applying the principle of natural capital accounting to policy and practice um, in Rwanda. Okay, so thank you so much again, uh, Hon Honorable State Minister. Uh, we want to move to um, uh, the final part of the introductory session. Uh, I know some of you who have not attended the NCA forum before are wondering why we're here um, and would really like to know what exactly um, is happening um, in terms of how we integrate knowledge, policy, and finance. Um, and we are most privileged, of course, to, to have uh, uh, our colleague, Dr. Valerie Hickey. Uh, Dr. Valerie is currently the Global Director for Environment, uh, Natural Resources, and the Blue Economy at the World Bank. Um, and we know that you lead a very big portfolio. Um, I would um, 
many of us that have interacted with the World Bank actually see the the day-to-day -day work that World Bank does in supporting countries, building capacity, you know, strengthening policies and so on. And I think that's very important. So we look forward, of course, Valerie, to your keynote. Get us started. So could we have a round of applause as we welcome Dr. Valerie Hickey? Thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. Honorable State Minister Claudine, UN Resident Representative Dr. Double O, thank you so much for all the cooperation of the UN, of course, who is our partner in natural capital accounting, our own great leader here in Rwanda, Dr. Saar, delegates and future shoppers, and everybody watching us online. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. All protocol observed. I want to start by thanking very much the government and the people of Rwanda for hosting us here this week. But more importantly, I want to thank the government and the people of Rwanda for finally putting an end to the old economic paradigm of grow now, clean up later. Because Rwanda has proven that in the 21st century, if you want to grow fast, you grow green. And that's what this week is all about. Learning why having the data and analytics to show that the new economic paradigm, the correct economic paradigm, is that if countries want to grow fast, we must grow green. And it's in fact the inspiration of countries like Rwanda and several of other countries that are here with us today that has forced us at the World Bank to update our mission, as Dr. Saar was saying. Our new mission is to end poverty on a livable planet. Because we recognize that we will never have a world without poverty in a world without nature. But it's not because we want more nature for its own sake. The old tradition, the terrible tradition of fortress conservation, for example, of asking countries and communities to forego their own prosperity so that there could be elephants, so there could be rhinos. That paradigm has to end. And instead, it's about understanding and ensuring that nature, that natural capital, is an engine of jobs and GDP. That nature and natural capital is the only way we're going to bend the curve of climate emissions to zero. Even if there was a special room in the world where people like John Kerry could turn off every coal-fired power plant in the world tomorrow, it wouldn't make a difference as long as we're cutting down forests. And so we will never end climate change if we end nature. That's why at the World Bank, when we think about biodiversity, we work across four pillars. The first is making sure that even as the world has committed under the Global Biodiversity Framework to the 30 by 30 agenda, protecting 30% of the land and sea by 2030, we don't forget the other 70%. Because nature does not just exist in national parks. Natural resources are everywhere. I was lucky enough yesterday to be able to go visit one of the urban wetlands here in Kigali. Please, if you have a moment, go. And this just shows that in the middle of an incredibly bustling city, nature can become an engine of increasing land prices. It's an engine of recreation. It's an engine of bringing tourism to the city. So nature is not just in our national parks, it is everywhere. Our second pillar is making sure that when it comes to working on biodiversity, we expand the partners with whom we work. It's no longer just about working with ministries of environment. It's about working with ministries of finance, with central banks. Nobody knows this better than Honorable State Minister Claudine, who has worked across these two important ministries. It's about working not just with the public sector, but with the private sector. And when we talk about working with the private sector, it's not just working with the big multinational corporations. It's about working with the micro and small businesses who are at the heart of creating those jobs that depend on nature. It's about working with civil society and it's about working with communities. Our third pillar when it comes to working biodiversity, and this is an important one, is mobilizing finance. 
at the end of the day, money makes the world go round. And money is necessary for us to be able to unlock nature as an engine of jobs and GDP. And our role of the World Bank is to make sure that we can broker deals and bring together international grant finance to unlock our own money, to bring it together with domestic public budget together, create enough money at scale to do the work that's necessary so that nature can grow and that in turn the jobs and GDP that it leverages can grow. But the fourth pillar, and probably the one that's most critical for today and this week, is that we're working on data and analytics. We have to measure so that we can manage. And we know that the kind of natural capital accounting that you all have been practicing is critical to making sure that nature is put on the balance sheets of government and the balance sheets of the private sector. To make sure that nature is discussed in the cabinet room and in the corporate C-suites. Because that's where the decisions are made. And having this data is there not, again, for its own sake, but to drive decision making. We've used natural capital accounting data, for example, to create an economic case for nature. To show that if, for example, agriculture was to become more biodiversity smart, you could increase agricultural production to the value of $150 billion, 80% of which would flow to low and middle income countries. That would be tens of billions of dollars in the pockets of rural communities. That's the path to development. We've used natural capital accounting data to look at the value of protected areas and tourism, to be able to prove that for every dollar that a tourist spends, that hopefully all of us are going to spend this week in Rwanda, leads to $6 in value created locally. And it's not just about creating economic value. The same data helped us to understand the importance of protected area for jobs. We have colleagues here from Zambia. 14% of the working age population, think about that, 14% around the lower Zambezi National Park are employed by the park. In the South Luanga National Park, it's 30%. Almost one in three people who work, work because of that national park. But it's important that natural capital accounting is not just there to be a cheerleader for nature. It's also there to show us when things are not working so well. Because this is important. We just celebrated World Wildlife Day this past weekend. 10 years ago, every 20 minutes, an elephant was poached on this continent. Every 20 minutes. Because of the blood, sweat, tears, and money invested by African countries and communities, that has stopped. This year, we celebrate thriving elephant populations across the continent. But natural capital accounting has showed us that that's not all just a good news story. It's led to increased human-wildlife conflict, for example. And that's leading to money being taken from the pockets of some of the poorest communities in this country. And those same examples in Zambia. We see that, for example, around the Lower Zambezi, there's been a 14% impact on crop production. Around South Luanga, it's 11%. Together, that's been a loss of $3 million to the small farmers around those national parks because the parks have been successful at protecting wildlife. Natural accounting, natural capital accounts can tell us that. They can help identify not just what's working, but what's broken, and it's not just broken here, we're seeing the, seeing the same issues across the world. Nepal is having the same problems with human wildlife conflict. Around Chitwan National Park, one of the most famous national parks in Nepal, they've lost over $3 million of crops because of human wildlife conflict. So natural capital accounting and the data it gives us, helps us understand these issues and helps make sure these issues are in front of decision makers in cabinet and in corporate C-suites. 
And that's why we're here this week, because so much has been done in the 23 countries that together with the UN we've been able to support to do natural capital accounting. But the job is not done. It is not finished. And in particular, I think there are three things we need to do more. And we're going to spend these next two days figuring out exactly how to do that. The first, we need to have more than 23 countries around this table. The global biodiversity framework that everybody agreed to as part of the Kunming Montreal consensus agreed in December 2022 has 22 targets and there's four indicators that require natural capital accounting. So we need every country to have natural capital accounting. And that means the contagion among peers has to accelerate. And that's something we're going to be calling on all of you to help us do. Spread the story, spread the learning, so we can accelerate having more NCA done in more countries. But it's not just that we need more countries. Even in the countries where NCA has been done, we need to deepen it for decision making. We need to make sure that natural capital accounting does not just sit in the Department of Statistics. That is not job done. Job done is when it's used for decision making. One of the big conversations we're having at the World Bank at the moment is about subsidies and repurposing subsidies at a time when countries are struggling under $235 trillion of global debt. Trillion dollars of global debt. We need to find ways to make money available. And already, there's $1.2 trillion spent on subsidies, most of them working against countries, all of them working against nature. And that's money that can be repurposed. Just in agriculture alone, for example, natural capital accounting helps us understand that the $635 billion spent annually on agricultural subsidies, only one third of which, by the way, goes to farmers is responsible for a quarter of deforestation, even more degradation. In part because many of these subsidies, for example, are spent on fertilizers. And yet we know through natural capital accounting, through data and analysis, that a 10% increase in the use of fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, leads to less than a 2% increase in production on farm. That's not a good return on investment, worse yet, it leads to a 7% reduction in labor productivity because of nitrogen poisoning. That is not a good return on investment. And at a time when countries do not have money to waste, we have to use natural capital accounting to help us make the right decisions on repurposing subsidies so the same farmers can get the same finance, but to do biodiversity smart agriculture. But it is not just about having more countries do more NCA, having the countries that do NCA do better decision making. It's about using natural capital accounting to influence financial flows. Because the truth is, in this sector, we need more money. Managing natural resources, managing renewable natural capital is expensive. And this means we need more money from domestic public budgets, from the private sector, and we need to better use international public finance. When it comes to domestic public budgets, less than 1% of domestic public budgets globally are used for renewable natural resources, less than 1%. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that too many ministers of finance who own the purse strings, who control the purse strings, don't have the data in front of them to understand that their future wealth is built on their ability to manage their renewable natural capital and transform the flow of goods and services into jobs and GDP. So if we want more than that 1%, if we want more rural and coastal communities to be able to benefit from domestic public budgets and find a path out of poverty, we have to use natural capital accounting to show why renewable natural capital is an asset as important, as valuable, as produced capital, as economic and financial capital. The same is true of the private sector. We have to unlock more private sector 
capital into the renewable natural resource and nature sectors. And we have to do this first by greening finance. In fact, there is a lot of private capital, private money that intersects with nature, but too much of it is causing a problem for nature. And too few private sector companies understand how important nature is for their businesses. We worked in Malaysia with the central bank and we reviewed with them their entire commercial loan portfolio across the country. And we were able to show them that 54%, over half of that entire commercial loan portfolio, was heavily dependent on renewable natural capital. Again, using natural capital accounting data. We were able to show that basically, if they wanted to avoid the mother of all financial crises, they needed to stop doing what they were doing to degrade natural capital. Because half of the companies that had loans on their books would not be able to repay those loans. If water disappeared, if the land became too degraded, if nature disappeared. And that's the kind of work we need to do to begin to show central banks and private companies the risk they're taking by not paying attention to nature. But we also need to make sure there are more flows into nature. There's already a lot of private capital going into the three big nature-based sectors, forestry, fisheries, and nature-based tourism. We need to make sure more of that money is biodiversity smart and is available for local communities. It doesn't leak away to foreign capitals. And that means working especially with local banks because when it comes to micro and small businesses in rural and coastal communities who want to, be, who want to build biodiversity businesses, who want to be part of nature-based tourism, they don't come to the World Bank for a loan. They don't go to the big international banks for a loan. They go to their local bank and we need to work with those local banks so that they understand why it's so important to finance biodiversity-based businesses and why these are bankable businesses. And that's the job we have to do in natural capital accounting. And finally, as we use natural capital accounting to influence domestic public budgets and unlock more private capital, we have to use it to better leverage international public finance. Only around 10% of international public finance has anything to do with biodiversity, however vaguely. That's not a lot. We need more of it, and we need to use it better. We need to use international public finance not to support green projects, but to do what Rwanda is doing and build green economies. That means using it smartly for the things that governments can't borrow for, to make sure that when they do borrow, projects are shovel ready, to make sure that the international public finance is used for the sort of institutional strengthening that countries can't borrow for, that countries can't afford themselves. We also need to use international public finance better to de-risk for the private sector, to show them that biodiversity is a bankable business. If they don't know yet and they want to take baby steps, let's help them along the way. Let's de-risk. Let's co-invest. Let's give them some credit enhancement so we can deliver those private sector funds. And that's what we're here for this week. And that's why I'm so excited to be part of these discussions the next two days because there are enormous lessons in this room of people who have already done what we need to do more of, people who have influenced their public budgets, who have helped drive decision-making towards showing exactly what Rwanda shows every day, that in the 21st century, if you want to grow fast, you grow green. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valerie. If you want to grow fast and grow quickly, you also have to take care of your nature. Um, colleagues, I think we're coming to the end of the first session. Uh, just to say that um, we'll request uh, our guest, um, Honorable Minister, and uh, um, our, our keynote speakers this morning uh, to have a group uh, photo um, with the participants. So we'll be guided, uh, there's a team out here that's guiding us. And just to say that uh, we have 30 minutes during which you have uh, the group photo and then we have uh, a break uh, for tea and coffee 
um, and, and also we didn't have time to introduce each other. So I'm hoping during this time, uh, you have the opportunity to talk to your colleagues, uh, uh, your neighbors, get to know them, get to know where they're coming from, so that we also use that, uh, that time to, to, to network. Um, so we will actually, we will take the photo here. That's what I'm informed. Uh, so we just give our colleagues uh, a few minutes to set up the, uh, the logistics. In the meantime, I just wanted to say that um, the keynote speech uh, uh, by Dr. Valerie Hickey really sets the stage for, for the, all of this forum. Um, we know we are looking at four themes uh, this in, uh, in this forum. Uh, the first one is actually economic case uh, for nature. Um, the second theme is natural capital data, uh, natural capital account analysis for biodiversity and ecosystems. Uh, the third theme is looking at how do we get incentives uh, right for biodiversity conservation? And I think you really talked a lot about subsidies, which I think is a challenge uh, for productive sectors like agriculture and so on. We see that it's always uh, a case where you see a lot of trade-off. Um, and the last, not least, is how do we mobilize finance uh, for biodiversity con conservation? So um, as I said in the morning, uh, these themes uh, will be debating this team, discussing these themes um, around uh, 10 sessions uh, between today and, and tomorrow. We will also have, as we have had uh, Valerie's uh, keynote, is the first keynote. We will have a keynote again uh, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, in, in the first session of tomorrow morning. Uh, we um, will have a second keynote address, um, which will look at um, policies for conserving and financing nature uh, in developing countries. We know that developing countries, of course, are struggling uh, with finance. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Agrawala from Bennett Institute of Public Policy at Cambridge University uh, will be our second keynote uh, uh, speaker tomorrow. OK, so uh, I see my team is ready. Do we have a thumbs up? Great. Uh, so I would like to request um, Honorable um, Minister and uh, our chief guests to